Hello, my name is Christian Beckner, Senior Director for Retail Technology and Cybersecurity at the National Retail Federation. Thank you for joining us today for this NRF Cybersecurity Webinar, examining critical and timely cybersecurity issues relevant to the retail industry. Divi Cloud by Rapid7 is joining us today for a discussion on securing the cloud through defense in depth, providing the case study of the approach that Kroger has taken with respect to cloud security. Chris Hertz, Vice President for Cloud Security Sales at Divi Cloud, will be joined in conversation with Sean McShay, Executive Director for Digital Innovation at Kroger, and Thomas Martin, former CIO at GE and founder of Nefosec. Chris, Sean, and Thomas, thank you for joining us today. And Chris, let me turn it over to you to kick off today's discussion. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Sean and, and Thomas, for speaking with us. Uh, I think we had a quick introduction there, but Sean, do you want to start out with just a... Uh, a little background on yourself, and then maybe we can draw over Thomas for the same. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. So I'm Sean McShay. I lead in, have a great pleasure of uh, having fun every day with driving our technology modernization around our platforms that touch our core data centers, as well as our 2,800 stores, manufacturing sites, distribution centers, as well as driving our transformation from shifting on-prem into the cloud and bringing that business value to life. Thomas? Gladly, thanks, John. So Thomas Martin, uh, as, as mentioned, uh, was formerly with General Electric and worked with the uh, cloud team to migrate a little over 9,000 workloads to public cloud. And with that experience, have launched into Nefosec, where we work with clients like Sean and Kroger uh, particularly on the Divi Cloud product, as well as other areas to work to secure the cloud. Over to you, Chris. Thanks. Well, and, and Sean, I have to imagine that over the last couple months, Kroger has been particularly busy uh, in, this, in this new world. I, I assume that's correct? That is very correct. We have uh, shifted rapidly from working in our offices to working from home, making sure that we can continue to feed America and serve our 11 million customers daily, whether that's through uh, pick up, delivery, or within our stores, keeping customers and our associates safe. Well, and, and thank you for all that because, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big service for everyone who's, uh, who's working through this pandemic right now. So thanks for all your efforts and all the efforts your associates and everybody involved. Well, let me, let me start out by setting the table a little bit, and then let's dive into, Sean, some of your experience. But I wanted to start out by um, describing what we see as we look at uh, many of the companies at Divi Cloud by Rapid7 works with as, who are adopting cloud. First, we see technology innovation um, being a, a, a really being driven by a need to innovate, um, by the desire to deliver better experiences or different experiences to react to market pressures, just like, like Sean, you were talking about. Um, and that, that really drives the adoption of cloud because it provides an agile, transforming, uh, so service and set of services. And so technology innovation is really about, in this graph, is really about the adoption of new cloud services. And that's often multi-cloud, it's often multiple services per cloud. Um, and the pace of that adoption is accelerating and that's happening simultaneous to all the unplanned digital workforce, workforce disruptions occurring that, that Sean just described. And what we see is that's creating this three-dimensional secure, security achievement gap, this risk created by pace of innovation and disruption that's occurring. And that's on top of, of often what customers and companies have felt comfortable managing traditionally. Um, and so part of what I'd love to dive in with you, Sean and, and Thomas, is really let's understand a little bit about what this security achievement, achievement gap looks like. You know, what, what does it practically look like? And then how, how has Kroger really you know, taken stance to, and steps to drive the closure of this gap? And so with that, uh, I thought maybe just I'd, I'd tee it up and say the first thing that, that we feel is self-evident is that misconfigurations are uh, really quite problematic. Um, one, it, when we did, a, we did a 2020 cloud misconfigurations report, we saw from 2018 to 2019, there was a 41% increase in major uh, breaches due to misconfigurations. And that across all cloud misconfigurations, um, there was an estimated 5 trillion in, in, in costs, both sort of economic, reputational costs, all those things in US dollars. Um, Sean, uh, Thomas, is this, does this ring true to you? Is this, do you guys think about misconfigurations and that shared responsibility model of cloud as being something that is a concern? Um, yeah, Chris, I'll tell you what, this is the one area that probably keeps me up at night the most um, and definitely one of our focus areas that we, we've invested from day one 
with our cloud journey. Yeah. And it's one thing that obviously Divi Cloud definitely helps bring some great visibility and actions to uh, take take in count for anything that can be misconfigured. But it also goes to how fast are companies adopting cloud and are they appropriately allocating enough training to bring their customers along that journey? Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. So, you know, it sounds like tip of the tip of the iceberg in terms of misconfigurations. What are, as you adopted cloud, what were the, what were the things that Kroger saw as sort of increased challenges for IT security professionals in this new cloud world? Yeah, it's, um, it's kind of a misnomer when you say we're going to go from the data center into the cloud and, just take all the tools and the way that you've been trained over the course of your career and just bring it into this new operating model. It's a fallacy, unfortunately, that you really need to bring in some experts from whoever you're going to be partnering with and bring up the right training for your internal associates. And then from there, really making sure you're partnering with other industry uh, best practice experts that can help coach you along the early stages of your journey to make sure that you don't have a lot of those misconfigurations and you're investing upfront for what we consider kind of your building Lego blocks. You wanna make sure those are solid. And yeah. with, with that, it really brings peace of mind and also brings a good framework behind it. Well, it, it sounds like what you're saying is there's a few different elements, right? That it's not that, that it isn't as simple as simply a technology migration, right? That actually this is, it, it requires cultural changes, organizational changes, process changes, um, you know, uh, training to individuals, right? To upskill them and change their skill set. Um, you know, and then reinforcing all that with tooling that, that reinforces that strategy. Is, is that accurate summary of sort of all the, the challenges that, that IT security, you know, it's not just, it's not just a technical one, right? It's, it's sort of this broad, strategic challenge that IT security professionals have to engage in. Yeah, absolutely. It's got to be a initiative that's coming from the very top of the company and you really need to invest in the organizational change management of such a major shift of going to the cloud. And we found with that investment, we started getting that right momentum and without it, you really do struggle. Yeah. And well, Chris, so, to, to build a, if I may just real quick yeah. build on that one piece, and yeah. that is, is it, it isn't just security professionals, right? I think it's one of the things yeah. that you and I have talked a lot about is the fact that it really is a democratization of security itself when working with the cloud. And that, as you know, as Sean talked about, it's, it's a huge educational piece because everyone now has a, a much stronger responsibility to, to help secure those resources. And Sean, you know, we often see enterprises rushing through the cloud adoption lifecycle. So you just talked about this, you know, and, and I, I love it. You're talking about, you gotta go through cultural changes and organizational changes and technology changes and people changes and, and process changes and tooling changes. And, and yet we often see customers or, or companies that say, hey, we're gonna do this in the next three months, <laughs> right? Um, what, are, what, you know, what, are, what are some of the challenges that, that come up in your opinion when you're, when, when you are moving through the cloud adoption lifecycle that quickly? When you're going that fast, you don't have the proper time to test and learn in a safe manner. Yeah. And if you're going to simply go that fast for some other value, you really need to either just best practice, bring in somebody who's going to help offset your security side or realize if you, <laughs> If somebody's telling you to move that fast, you really need to rethink your cloud strategy without yeah. the right partners. And and t let's talk through how did I know you know Kroger I know has driven innovation right. I mean you guys are known for that. I know you've done that by doing rapid cloud adoption, but I you've done it securely. Can you walk me through a little bit about how how you've done that? Yeah, early on uh, working with our security organization in our CISO, we picked a framework as our base layer. So we went through with NIST um, cybersecurity framework and we call it kind of the NIST plus. Obviously there's other 
industry standards that we need to leverage around payments or pharmacy health data, but also we look at other um, big industries standards when it comes to uh, baselining with uh, CSA and other open frameworks and really enhancing that. But getting that base layer framework, making sure everybody understands what we're shifting to and being very open about it within the company. Then from there, really leveraging whomever your cloud provider is, their native security tools. They're gonna know it the best, they're building it, they're in it every day, leverage it, do not discount what you have there. But then also make sure that you have other tools that are looking at your entire ecosystem. And that's where we brought in Divi Cloud to make sure because one of those very uncommon pieces that everybody gets from a four walls of your data center protected by your network security team of a firewall, they keep exposing buckets to the public world and it keeps ending up on the Wall Street Journal and none of us want to be there. Yeah. And that is one of those great features and peace of mind that a uh, product like Divi Cloud has brought to Kroger. Yeah, that's awesome. Thomas, anything you want to layer on there from, from your experience working with Kroger? You know, I, I think uh, as you know, Sean talked about, by, by establishing that framework early um, and incorporating that into the broader organizational sense of how they're adopting cloud, it gave us that ability as we partnered with them to, as we were establishing and setting up the product, to, to put in those automations to not only culturally uh, help with that that shift and change, but also as you know, as Sean talked about, to ensure whether it's a new resource or one that's been you know running in its established life cycle. If it goes against something, a policy that's going to expose anything, um, it certainly is remediated extremely quickly by the product. So yeah. it's, I think it's just added that uh, that overall sense of security. Well, let's talk about frameworks because Sean, you brought up frameworks, and it's it's an area that's near and dear to my heart. Um, we actually, we did a survey and uh, again, our, our state of enterprise cloud and container adoption and security survey, which we've then turned into a report. And out of, uh, out of all the IT professionals surveyed, 42% do not, did not know which frameworks their company used to maintain compliance with standards and regulations. And I, I want to posit a hypothesis on, on why that is and, and then maybe, you know, and then I'll turn it over to you to Sean to see if it, it resonates with you. But you know, first let's recognize that's not good because um, if we've democratized access to cloud, right, if we've moved from a command and control world in which data centers were, were tightly controlled to a world that really enables self-service access to cloud infrastructure, so whether that's Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, <clears throat> um, there is a desire uh, for, you know, to, to sort of access that agility, and to do so, you, you give access to lots more people. So you've gone from maybe a small confined number of people who really know what good looks like, who are provisioning, configuring all the infrastructure for the entire organization, to now maybe dozens if not hundreds, in some cases thousands of people who are participating in that process. And the challenge of course is they don't know what good looks like and frameworks can provide a really good way to do that. And of course, because they're doing all this, they're now really intimately involved in cloud operations and they are therefore intimately involved in security. And we need them to be able to, to you know, the democratization of cloud has to cut both ways. It's both the access to it, but also the operation of it. And so frameworks tend to be a great way for us to demonstrate to people what good look like uh, and then communicate that to them. And so clearly when organizations respond back and 42% and of IT professionals don't know what that is, it means we've failed as part of that cloud adoption journey to educate the, the now democratized act, you know, people uh, with what good looks like and really make them participate in the, se the security process. And I think that's that's problematic. And I think, you know, from your point of view, um, Sean, you talked about NIST cybersecurity framework. We certainly also see customers doing things like NIST 8023 or the CIS benchmarks or ISO 27001 or SOC 2. These are all, you know, and then sometimes regulatory burdens, PCI DSS, HIPAA, GPR. Um, does, does that make sense to you, you know, in the sense that if, if if people are saying they don't know the framework, that that creates a gap, um, and it also seems to be a failing on the part of the organization that there hasn't been enough of a feedback mechanism to these folks to really educate them on what good looks like? Yeah, it, it's definitely a huge gap, and one that I believe our CISO 
is definitely well aware of that's out there that if you go back in time, most of the time when you think early on in your career and technology and development, security was never a good thing. It was like going to the principal's office. <laughs> so, so now that we're adapting and moving into really this, uh, you can call it DevSecOps world where we're all working together and to your point, um, democratizing this to enable these teams to move fast and really unlock the innovation, the business value that our companies need to get in front of our customers. It's got to be a partnership. And that's where our CISO um, says it greatly, right? It's just not his security team that's on point for security. It's all of our responsibility for security every day. Yeah. And your point, Chris, that's why a framework, even as your base layer, is so important for people to understand within your organization and within the culture that saying, this is our baseline, this is what we need to measure people to and hold people to, and make it simple for them to, to collaborate and partner together internally to keep the company safe and moving fast to unlock that business value that's critical. Yeah, well said. Thank you. Well, so let's talk about, um, you know, and Sean Thomas, I'll open this to you. One of the, the, the things that we've heard a lot is that IT professionals are, are not really equipped to operate in the cloud securely. And I think you've solved for this problem a little bit in Kroger. And maybe, Thomas, maybe if you could frame up what you think that looks like. And then maybe, Sean, we can go to the next slide and talk about how you've, how you've really tried to solve for that at Kroger. Sure, Chris. I think, you know, uh, the things that I've observed, and it's 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 certainly with Kroger and, and, and where I've seen it also successfully with some other clients, is just uh, one realizing that that there is a a bit of a chasm, if you will, about the way teams operated prior to what it requires in the cloud today, ensuring that there's that right level of education, and, and Kroger's certainly done a ton of that, working with the individual cloud providers out out to the individual folks, but then also ensuring that you're placing uh, your, you know, the, those folks that have that level of experience, those solution architects and others, and embedding them uh, with the individual application teams as they go through the journey and almost setting up uh, you know, a train the trainer scenario where you're helping those organizations rise to that level of education and understanding. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I often, you know, when we are talking with IT professionals, and this is when I think of this, it's more than the security, right? It's often the, the things that come up are, do I have the right education? Do I have the right um, processes defined? Do I have the systems that are reinforcing those processes and, and, and guiding me and providing a feedback loop so I know when I'm, I'm you know, driving the proverbial bus off the road or about to, um, right? Those are, and, and am I able to then see how I'm doing? Right, so in part, it's just, I need visibility into that because otherwise, how do I know, right? I've got no scorecard that's gonna help me. I've got no dashboard to, to tell me what, what am I trending better or worse than I was a week or two ago. Uh, and so I think all that is stuff that IT professionals need and need, need that. And let's, let's talk a little bit about um, maybe, Sean, can you talk us through how you've approached that to really arm folks at Kroger to make sure that they are in a good place and, and can uh, be participant in, in the cloud operations process? Absolutely. And to your point, process is extremely important. Process changed from the ways that we used to do within the data center into the cloud, but it's kind of a misnomer where a lot of people think going to the cloud, you can just, um, it was kind of like people's transition from waterfall project methodology to agile, thinking that you don't have to document and that you just quickly deliver and there's no dates to deliver. Well, I think a lot of people's cloud journeys were the same, that it turned into the wild, wild west and got a lot of companies in trouble with their approach. And that's one area that you need to make sure that you have a process. And one of the greatest assets of a cloud journey is really giving people up-to-date information out of um, the tools in front of you in a real, whether you call it a CMDB or just asset inventory, that's accurate, unlike what we've seen for the last few decades. 
And that's why, as you can see, tagging is critical. Whether you, you're using tagging for information about what you're deploying, whether you're using it for bots and making sure that things are staying to standards, I cannot stress it enough, your tagging strategy is crucial. You need to invest upfront to make sure that you do it appropriately and you think through it and you partner with your cloud provider because then tools that you throw in like Divi Cloud easily can consume that and then it can take action against anything that could be violating your policy. And that's one thing that we just did upfront and it was great to be able to demo in front of a executive steering committee and our CISO that we published a um, bucket that was public to the world and within a minute it was detected and closed down. Wow, it, it yeah. Really sweet. And I loved, you know, that that's a, um, it's a great, you know, great, great segue. I mean, um, you know, maybe a little bit of automation. I mean, you know, Thomas, you've talked a lot about automation and, and orchestration in the past. Do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about how you see that as being super important to to the world of, of sort of cloud operations and cloud security? Absolutely. I, you know, I think one of the things that, that that gets highlighted on this slide is is thinking about and treating existing resources, and I call them the horses that have already left the barn. Um, that as you bring in a product um, like to be cloud to, to to look at the resources differently, and that is there's resources that are already existing or or in a state that have been running for a long period of time and those that have just been immediately created. And you're gonna to wanna to handle those differently and you may even wanna handle them differently across different environments. But this is just an example of where, you know, you can go from notification for existing and then making sure that that goes through maybe a ticketing system if it's not something that's gonna cause actual security damage. Uh, but to a newly created one, you may wanna go ahead and immediately remediate it and then utilizing a collaborative uh, solution like Teams to provide immediate feedback to those application teams that that went against policy. And just on the right-hand side, you can see you know, one of the beauties is just this ability to kind of stack out that automation to not only market you know, uh, non-compliant, allowing folks to take remediation if they want, but then ultimately delete that resource. Yeah, I, I always, you know, we always talk about automation with folks and people get very nervous sometimes about automation because it, it, I think their mind immediately goes to this idea that they're going to take some sort of action in the cloud. And, and we always say, hey, look, there's sort of, there's three ways that we think about automation. The first is automating process. And I, you know, I'd love Sean for you to maybe respond to this, but you know, for us, we say, start with, you know, the, the basic blocking and tackling of, of operations and cloud security is, is just is sort of process. It's notification, ticketing, logging, messaging, right? The things that otherwise, as you scale into cloud, would just consume every waking moment of the day for uh, security engineers and, and, I, yeah, and cloud operations folks, because the signal to noise ratio and the scale is so enormous, right? You're going from maybe a data center where you had a set number of people to, you know, covering, let's say, let's say 5,000 virtual machines to a cloud services environment that might at scale have tens of millions of resources, right? And, and the signal noise ratio and the scale of that is overwhelming if, if, for example, tagging, if you just wanna say, let me just do tagging enforcement. Well, if 5,000 new objects are created every day and half of those aren't tagged appropriately and you need to go message people telling them to go tag that stuff, that by itself is, is like a full-time job for a team. And yet you can't afford to have people focused on the, that sort of low level blocking and tackling. Um, you need to free them up to be able to attack the high value challenges that, um, that are identified, right? Risk remediation and reduction. And, and that's where the first level of automation is really about how do you automate the process and do that in a consistent way that scales. Uh, the second level of automation is really about orchestration. And that's about how do you orchestrate even sort of broader third party tooling, right? So how do you ensure that, um, that I'm, I, that audit logging is enabled in, in all of my cloud environments, right? So I'm going back and saying, all right, if I'm running in Azure, if I'm running in GCP, and I, I, I wanna make sure that, that I know, um, you know, that I have logging enabled. If someone turns that off, let me make sure that goes and gets turned back on, because that's, that's sort of a third party native tool that needs to always be enabled. And so part of this, of what we really see automation is, is how do you leverage automation to make operations easier and more efficient? 
right? So that you're leveraging all the tools in a consistent way. So you have a single security posture that cuts across that, that, that never is going to be violated. And then I think the third is really then going in and saying, hey, in extreme sense, you know, cases, let's go take, let's actually go take a lifecycle action. Let's change a cloud resource, reconfigure it or delete it um, or make some modification to it that makes it secure or compliant. And sometimes you find all those things together. Um, does that sound right to you, Sean, based on your experience, you know, you know automating in, in the cloud operations, cloud security world? It does, Chris. It's, it's definitely one of those things that you go and you mature. So to your point of your phases, it's definitely the way that we went into it. And, you know, it's when you're looking at data analytic jobs and their ephemeral nodes that you're spinning up probably one, two, three thousand each night, and then they blow away after their analytic has run and return the results. It's hard, you can't even fathom doing that within your data center and having to follow a legacy ticketing system, which yeah. is why it's so crucial to make sure that you have the automation built uh, to tag these resources, to record it and make sure that they integrate within all your systems for that record. And then to your other point of bringing it to that next level of anything that could violate kind of that more harmful area where you're exposing buckets or perhaps uh, you have somebody new and they just deployed a resource that's in a different country than you normally work. Mm. I mean, those are other things that we've turned on right out of the box to make sure that uh, we stay safe and that we stay within kind of that control and reduce that blast radius. Yeah. Well, and I, I guess, you know, I, let me ask one last question, Sean. I mean, as you think about, you know, where the, what the future holds, what are you, what are you thinking about right now? As you think about the future of cloud security, what, what worries you today? What, what sort of new and novel things is Kroger looking at as, as you move forward in that new world? Yeah, we're always looking. I mean, at the end of the day, we all realize that security is the one thing that will never go away in any of our journeys. And it's even more important as we push more workloads into the cloud and how we operate as a business each day to continually stay up because there is no end zone when we talk about this journey of cloud and security. It's constantly changing, it's constantly evolving, and you just gotta stay up with it. And that's where smart partners will help get you, get you through this journey. Yeah, well, uh, and to that point, um, we've been excited to be a partner to Kroger for, for some time now. And um, you know, thank you, Sean and Thomas, for spending um, about 30 minutes with me today talking through that journey. Um, I did want to quickly mention that Divi Cloud uh, protects cloud and container environments from a lot of things we've been talking about, misconfigurations, policy violations, threats, identity and access management challenges across Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, Alibaba Cloud, and then Kubernetes as the layer. And really that's across infrastructure as service, platform as a service, functions as a service, containers as a service. Um, and uh, we've, uh, we've got a few helpful resources out there um, on the web. So for folks who are interested in learning a bit more, uh, I mentioned a few stats throughout this process. Um, the 2020 State of Enterprise Cloud and Container Adoption and Security Report is available for download, as is the 2020 Cloud Misconfiguration Support. Both great reports that can give you a lot of data on um, what peers are doing, what risks are out there, and provide some guidance on, on how to solve for those. Additionally, for many of our customers, identity access management is a uh, real and present concern, um, how to manage that at scale and how to govern it. Um, we've got a nice helpful uh, guide on that. And then certainly uh, last but not least, um, we invite you to gain full lifecycle cloud security today with a free 30 day trial of Divi Cloud by Rapid7. And you can do that with uh, divicloud.com slash free dash trial. So thank you, Sean. Thank you, Thomas. I really do appreciate you spending some time with me and, and offering your insights. It's been really uh, illuminating. Thank you. Gladly. Well, thank you, Chris, uh, and also to Sean and Thomas for uh, providing this uh, great discussion. And, and thank you to all of you who have listened to this webinar. Uh, I encourage you to uh, check out the resources that Divi Cloud has uh, provided on this screen and, and reach out to Chris and his colleagues to learn more. 
And if you have any feedback on this webinar or want to learn more about the cybersecurity activities at NRF, please feel free to contact me at cybersecurity at NRF.com. Thank you.